Morusi, a growing proportion of our research focuses on threats to national security, such as terrorism and organised crime. So this afternoon, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Sir Bernard Hogan Howe, who, as Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police Service, has been at the forefront of the UK's defence against these threats. He has served policing for almost 40 years and was appointed to lead the UK's largest police force in 2011. This afternoon, he's going to share his reflections on policing the metropolis, and we are honoured to be hosting his final public address. Sir Bernard. Thank you. Well, thank you, and good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for Tirusi for inviting me today. Uh, it's an honour for me to give my final speech uh, as the Commissioner at Rusi, uh, after all the work that you've done uh, to protect the security of the public in so many ways. Uh, it's prompted me to reflect, not just on my time leading the Met, uh, but what about policing means for me, and in particular our relationship with the public. I hope to share a little of that this afternoon. You'd think from what you'd read and hear that the relationship is not good, or not great. Uh, in fact, Londoners are more confident in the Met now than when I took over. Uh, and if you still believe opinion pollsters after 2016, you'll be aware that trust in policing has risen since 2011. So when the time comes to hand on this, uh, my warrant card, which I always keep in my uh, pocket, uh, I'll do so with pride, uh, uh, what I put into this badge and the values it represents. I humbly believe that the next generation of recruits to wear this are going are joining a service that's stronger, more professional and more capable than when I joined back in 1979, quite a long time ago. My core values came from my upbringing in Sheffield. I didn't like those who preyed on people on the estate where I lived with my mother. I always wanted to take on the bullies, people who used their position of strength to intimidate physically or sometimes psychologically. I still do. And if you go and ask the public today, as we often do, they'll tell you that they want the police, above all, to protect them. And that means, I believe, that police have a particular responsibility to protect the weak and vulnerable people who are less able to protect themselves. Correspondingly, we have a duty to ensure that we investigate without fear or favour. If allegations are made against those in powerful positions, we must not be deflected by their status. That will lead to tension at times between police and those in positions of power and responsibility, such as the media and politicians, both of which might be represented here today. I think that's a healthy sign of a democracy, where no one's above the law. When the public see police, the police being criticised by those in power, I hope they reflect upon that. It does frustrate me that when people call into question our motives for carrying out an investigation, our duties are set out very clearly in the oath of attestation to police officers, which they take on becoming a constable, which I uh, have taken with them over the last five and a half years. This is how it starts. I will well and truly serve the Queen in the office of constable, with fairness, integrity, diligence and impartiality, upholding fundamental human rights and according equal respect to all people, and that I will, to the best of my power, cause the peace to be kept and preserved and prevent all offences against people and property. I firmly believe the vast majority of the women and men I have the privilege to lead exhibit these values day in and day out. Where we do let people down, I honestly believe it's usually a mistake rather than malice. And to be absolutely clear, if we do see a sign of anything approaching corruption, we act. That's why we had to investigate the evidence that police officers and other public officials were being paid to hand over confidential information to journalists. We cannot afford to have our secure systems compromised. We encourage internal whistleblowers to call our confidential right line to report concerns. I personally make a point of looking each month to see what's reported. In fact, it's in my safe at the moment, waiting for this month's uh, uh, account. And I want to assure myself that our people are confident to get in touch. It's just one of the reasons why the Met's anti-corruption capability is recognised as one of the best in the world. So the public are right to trust the police, in my view. Right to trust the officers I met on New Year's Eve, allowing the public to enjoy that event despite the fears caused by the attack in Berlin and earlier in Nice. Right to trust the detectives in our sexual offending team who sit down and listen to horrendous accounts of abuse, take it seriously, accept what's been said and get on and then investigate. A right to trust our firearms officers, the people who will put their lives on the line to protect you and me from criminals and terrorists. I do want to focus on this particular group today, the officers who volunteer to carry firearms. 
I've spent a lot of time with them over the past year. When I decided we needed 600 more specialist firearms officers to protect the public and support our colleagues in the front line, I also decided to take a personal role in making sure it happened as fast as possible. So every few weeks since then, I've met officers from our firearms team to check on progress and do everything I can to make sure we clear the obstacles out of their way. Some of these obstacles are practical, training the officers, getting enough kit, getting the right kit. Some, though, are harder to deal with. In particular, officers have seen what happens to their colleagues who have had to use lethal force to protect the public. Increasingly, they seem to be portrayed as suspects, based, I can only assume, on an underlying belief that they must have acted in a criminal fashion if someone has died. As their leader, I'm hugely concerned about this. I know these officers, they don't come to work wanting to shoot someone. They certainly don't want to kill anyone. Apart from anything else they now know, is probably going to put their career in firearms on hold whilst there's an investigation. That can take years, which in my view is far too long. This is a dangerous place to be, I would argue, in two ways. First, it's getting in the way of recruiting to these critical roles. While we are well on track to fill this additional 600 roles that I've identified, we simply don't have enough people now wanting to do these jobs. The failure rate in training is high. It should be so that the public can be sure that only our best officers are allowed to carry a gun. So we always need more people volunteering than we have jobs, and we're now dipping in a very shallow pool of willing officers. Secondly, we can't afford to have officers think twice because they fear the consequence of shooting someone. That's how they get shot, or the public gets hurt, or a criminal gets away with a gun. Make no mistake, the last thing we want to do is to force a vehicle to stop because it's got an armed criminal inside it. It's dangerous for us, it's dangerous for the public, and it's dangerous for the criminal too. But sometimes we have no choice. Shootings are rare in the UK and rare in London. The city has got safer. For the five years prior to, sorry, for the six years prior to me taking over, on average we had 150 murders a year. In the six years while I've been here, then that's come down to an average of 110. Now, I'm going to claim that benefit. To some extent, it will be a medical improvement too. But I have to tell you, if it had gone the other way, you would have been asking me why the murders have gone up. So I'm going to claim some benefit from the fact that we achieved some reduction. I think we can reasonably play, say that we played a part in that. But 12 people were still shot dead by criminals in London in 2016. Now, it's 12 deaths too many, and we're concerned that we're seeing more guns, which is why we've put more officers into tackling this uh, particular problem. In fact, we recovered 697 firearms last year. So not far off two a day. Uh, we uh, have to have fire, highly trained firearms officers to counter the threat from armed criminals and, of course, terrorists. Those officers carried out more than 3,300 deployments involving firearms in 2016 in this city. But they didn't fire a single shot at a suspect. It's an urban myth that officers are trigger happy. They're not. The evidence is clear. In fact, one of the most notable cases last year, the fatal stabbing in Russell Square of an American citizen, the young man who was responsible had suffered a severe episode of mental health. He's alive today because our firearms officers who responded the, to be the first at the scene, within I think it was seven minutes, made a split second decision to use taser and not to use a gun. I think we will have enough specialist firearms officers to meet the current threat once the 600 have all been trained. But I'm sure my successor will want to keep under review the number equipped with taser as other forces issue them more widely to officers than the Met does. And this may be something I'm questioning we discuss. I recognise some people are concerned about this, but I think the public should be reassured that our police are well trained and cautious in their use of force. We do need to strike the right balance, but I strongly believe that when people look at what we do, there should be less suspicion and more trust. This may all sound a remote risk to those who think any police shooting is unjustified. Well, you probably don't live in the communities affected. It's not your family member who was shot or is in fear of their life. That's who we're trying to protect. And I really want the public to get behind our officers and show their support for them and ensure they get treated fairly after a shooting. That's, why I call for public, that's what I call for publicly after the Paris attack at the uh, Bataclan Theatre. 
And I was pleased when David Cameron, as Prime Minister, said he would commission a review of the legal position of firearms officers. I know they're looking forward to the outcome of that review. I think that Roos is the right place to highlight against the position of police officers after the public have been critical about the way our soldiers have been investigated too. This audience understands the security threats better than anyone, and I think there are some comparisons that can fairly be drawn. You've seen the use of lorries in Berlin and Nice, and you can be ensured that we have refreshed our tactics uh, for dealing with this kind of incident. They must always include the threat of legal, lethal force as a last resort. <coughs> We've seen how a heavy lorry can become an incredibly powerful weapon when a terrorist is at the wheel. We've had to be ready to stop that threat. Our officers will put their lives on the line when it matters. The Prime Minister, uh, Theresa May, rightly called them unsung heroes just before Christmas, and I agree. Our firearms officers are part of that defensive shield for Londoners, and they are very much unsung, unsung heroes. I'm grateful, too, that the Mayor acknowledged this when he stood side by side with them in August to announce that armed policing would be more visible in the capital. He chose his first opportunity as Mayor to meet firearms officers and said then how reassuring it was to see our brave, dedicated and incredibly skilled armed response officers in action. And he went on to thank every Met officer who's volunteered to put themselves on the front line of protecting Londoners. And I'd like to see politicians and the public follow his lead and be ready to support these officers on their difficult days, not just when it's uncontentious. I hope they'll support my successor as they continue to make the case for the financial support required to police this great and growing city, the engine of our country's economy. We all know there are tough times ahead. And as I've warned in recent weeks, there are some warning lights flashing. Traditional crimes are rising, including gun and knife crime, though the Met's total policing strategy has kept down this increase in the capital by deploying extra officers into the worst affected areas. The range of things we're asked to do as police is stretching as online crime increases and terrorism evolves. And our partners in local authorities are under severe financial pressure too, with things like cutbacks in CCTV here in Westminster and new services all being scaled back. The next commission will have to deal with all of this in a growing city, we are told 9 million by, the, uh, by 2020, with fewer officers. I know it's hard to put a price on public safety, but at a time of significant terrorist activity across Europe's capitals and major cities, in my view, it's vital that London continues to be seen as a safe place to live, work and visit. It's part of what makes this city so attractive to people of talent and enterprise from around the world, and that's a key reason why international businesses want to come here. Of course, keeping the capital safe brings with it some additional costs, such as policing state visits or upholding the right to protest. I'm sure the government recognises the economic value of a safe capital and won't put my successor into the position of having to choose between this and keeping our neighbourhoods safe. The threat from armed criminality and terrorism has been clear to the public from recent international events. But I've made plain over the last couple of years that the threats to public safety are numerous and varied. They include increased reporting of sexual offending against adults and children, including historic abuse a rise in reported domestic violence, an ongoing battle against knife crime. And then there's a new frontier of digital or cyber crime, which includes online hate, online hate crime, as well as fraud, predatory criminality, data theft, and hacking. If I could, I'd be putting more resources into all these areas. But the reality is, as I've just spelt out in recent weeks, is that we face losing officers at the time we most need to deploy them into other areas. So we can't just put more people into facing all of these threats. We're going to have to rationalise and prioritise. I'll finish today then by talking about our vision becoming more effective, more efficient and transforming the Met into the best digital police service. It's a well-developed vision which brings to life one of the biggest and most ambitious change programmes in the country. And it's why I believe my successor, although they will face real financial revenue uh, difficulties, will have a capital opportunity of spending capital uh, money, uh, is inheriting an organisation in good shape to deal with the future. The frontline police officer is at the centre of our vision. Our aim is simple, 
is to make them as effective as possible at keeping the public safe, being the best crime fighter they can possibly be, and earning the trust and confidence of every community in London. And there are going to be four ways we'll achieve that. Firstly, by providing real-time information to officers via smart mobile devices like tablets that will improve their situa situational awareness and their ability to understand and manage risk to the public. Secondly, transforming the way the public can get hold of the police through digital channels in a relationship based on transparency and accountability. Thirdly, professional support to our officers, whether that's the quality of data they receive to do their job or the ability to work smartly from better but fewer buildings. And finally, and most importantly in my view, a focus on investing in and trusting our people. It's their values and professionalism <coughs> that keep London safe. So let me quickly develop these areas for you. Firstly, how are we equipping our officers in the front line? At the core of policing is a need to understand and manage risk. Our ability to do that hinges on the quality of information our officers have and their ability to access and analyse it in a timely fashion, to anticipate threats and, of course, respond accordingly. If you're an officer on night duty called to an incident, you want information quickly to help you make the right decisions. We already have lots of information coming into our control rooms by various channels. <clears throat> we have live CCTV feeds. We've got data from auto automatic uh, recognition of number plates, which helps us track suspects and criminals. We have social media and other historic intelligence within policing systems. And critically, the information we get from the public calling us to report crime and tell us what they've seen. Receiving and analysing this information in real time is gold dust for commanders and for people in the front line. That's why I pushed hard to equip our officers with secure smart devices, tablets, phones, laptops, which will begin the rollout in earnest in the summer of this year. With these tools will come the ability to provide officers with live video streams we can see in the control room, up to the moment images of suspects or incidents they are about to encounter, real-time data from AMPR, that automatic number plate recognition, and the other intelligence feeds that we have. I believe this multi-channel capability offers huge potential to improve our ability to understand situational risks and to use data quickly to make the correct judgment to protect vulnerable people. Secondly, we are enabling the people who need our help to contact us via a range of digital and social channels, which are faster and easier to use. At the moment, we get about 4.5 million telephone calls a year. <coughs> People want to have a choice. But for those who want to get in touch directly, we're also investing in more dedicated neighbourhood officers and more welcoming police stations. I'm excited by the potential of digital policing. We've already used social media to mobilise taxi drivers in Marylebone to help us catch criminals. We're about to go live with a new website that will allow the public shortly to report far more crime online in a way which will be easier for them and, frankly, for us. We're moving on to allow the public to upload evidence to us of a crime like videos or photos. We're planning to introduce all that this year, allowing our officers for, to make much more rapid judgments about opportunities to investigate and catch offenders without the public having to wait a few days for an officer to deal with a non-emergency. Building a digital relationship with the public will allow us to deliver customised crime prevention information to protect their property and their own safety. Our new website will contain localised crime information for every one of London's 629 wards. And in time, if you wish, we will be able to contact you proactively by postcode to alert you of threats. It's the virtual equivalent to what we call cocooning, knocking on people's doors in the vicinity of a burglary to let them know so they don't become the next victim. We know from all the research we've done that the majority of the public want to help the police. We haven't always been very good at telling or enabling them to do so. The more they can help us prevent crime or investigate at speed, the more we can focus on sending our officers to protect the most vulnerable. Our role in this contract with the public is based on transparency and accountability. <clears throat> Where we've got it wrong, I've always been prepared to apologise, sometimes for mistakes from de decades ago. And I've not shied away from our difficulties ensuring they get properly looked at so we can get better. That's why at various times I've asked outside experts to look at how we deal with mental health, rape, and investigations of uh, allegations of historic abuse. I'm proud to say the Met now has more officers equipped with body-worn video than any other police in the world, 7,500. 
and within a matter of months that will rise to 22,000 and it will make a profound difference to the way policing is done on the streets. They let court see what happened in an incident and the evidence captured means our officers are even bigger fans than the public. They accept, as I always have done, that our duties include being held to account and that's why I welcome the role that modern technology <coughs> can play in ensuring that it is done fairly. I won't dwell on the third part of our vision, professional support for our officers, but I do want to say a few more words about our people and the role they play in our vision for the future. Police officers have been much maligned in recent years. Uh, I've done my bit at every opportunity to praise and celebrate their, their commitment, their passion, and with you today, their values. I've also been challenging. I've championed direct entry from outside policing into senior officers' roles, and we now have 13 superintendents, the major equivalents, and now as detectives, we're taking people directly from the street. I've supported Police Now, a scheme which originated in the Metropolitan Police to offer graduates a faster route into frontline policing as neighbourhood officers with us for two years, the equivalent of Teach First for the teaching profession. I've invested time and money in developing our leaders at all levels for the challenges of the future. I've indicated that I think we need fewer ranks to narrow the gap between the top and the bottom of the organisation to improve communication and decision making. We presently have nearly 50,000 people on the police side, 11 ranks. I believe we need less. I've done this because I trust our leaders and because I know the future demands more and more of us. If you just think about the opportunities that real-time information provides, it allows us for more, far more autonomous decision making and a need to move away from the old supervision model. The future will offer more freedom to officers, but also better and faster data that will support our evidence-based decision making and reduce the reliance on individual instincts. Some call this police reform. Some call it continuous improvement. For me, my time as commissioner and as a police officer has been a restless search for ways to stay ahead of criminals and improve the professionalism of policing. Our people are the most important part of this, this vision. And my successor is very lucky, in my view, to be inheriting the finest collection of officers and staff they will ever lead. London is a remarkable place, and I've been proud to lead the women and men of the Met as they strive to fulfil our ambition to make this the safest global city. They are an extraordinarily diverse bunch. We have someone from every single country in the European Union serving our ranks, and between us we speak nearly, well, nearly all of the 300 languages that you find in London's communities, including apparently Yorkshire. <laughs> one in three of our recruits at the moment is from a minority, and I look round, I can look every one of you in the eye and check whether or not you could say the same of your organisations. But I know I can of mine. I'm pleased that we've increased by a third the number of officers from minorities in my time as Commissioner. I can assure any Londoner from whatever background or ethnicity that they will feel welcome in the Met, just as London itself is a welcoming city. It welcomed me as a young man from Sheffield, and it's always welcomed people from all over the world. The values the Met adopted under my leadership, which are these, courage, compassion, integrity and professionalism are the main reasons why I'm so proud of the work we do to make this the safest global city. Courage, frontline police officers running towards trouble when others run away. Compassion, caring for victims and protecting the most vulnerable people. Professionalism, recognising and developing the skills and expertise our officers and staff need to do the job. And integrity, <coughs> the ethics and values that build public trust. Of course, as I've already said, in being a challenger my, by, my, by nature, we can always do better. Police officers aren't perfect. We have that grave problem that we employ human beings. We're human. There are moments when we let down the public, just like there are parts of our city that aren't perfect or the difficult, violent places to live. But I'll tell you what, though, I'll stand behind my, or in front of my 50,000 people against any other organisation in the world, because they'll take on the world and do a fantastic job. And we'll be there, however difficult, however violent the situation, running towards trouble, doing our best and our bit to protect the public, upholding our values, acting without fear of favour, and I believe making London safe for all our communities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I must also say, as a Yorkshire girl, I'm particularly proud to know that uh, we are well represented within the Met. Um, 
So we move on now to our question and answer uh, session. <coughs> Uh, just a quick reminder, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, in a departure from standard Rusi rules, this is on the record. Um, if you would like to ask a question, as I can see some of you already are doing, please do raise your hand. Um, uh, there are two microphones circulating, so please wait for a microphone, and then please introduce yourself before asking your question. Could I also just ask that you do keep them uh, relatively short, uh, because as you can see from looking around, there are plenty of people who would like to speak to our guests this afternoon. Um, I would, however, like to take the chair's privilege uh, and just ask the first question, <laughs> if you'll forgive me, um, because I want to pick up on something that you raised, Sir Bernard, um, during your remarks, um, which is regarding the use of tasers. The UK has always, and I think quite proudly, been sort of a, an unarmed policing nation, um, with sort of our armed response restricted to those specialist uh, armed response units. But increasingly, there are now suggestions that frontline officers should be more routinely armed uh, with tasers. Uh, and a survey that uh, came out this week uh, from the Metropolitan Police Federation suggested that approximately two, uh, sorry, three quarters of your officers would support that. So I'm quite keen to hear your thoughts. Okay. Um well, first of all, during my time here, just a little bit of history is that when I arrived five and a half years ago now, the Met had less tasers than places like Cumbria, which was an odd conclusion, but that was the, the reality. We had an awful incident uh, out in the, in the northeast where we had four officers who were attacked by a man who, was, man who was mentally ill with a very large butcher's machete. Uh, one ended up with the, the machete went through his cheek, could have part of his tongue, hit another one of the back of his leg got severely damaged, another one his arm. <clears throat> the fourth one got damaged by one of his colleagues, but we won't talk about that. But they were the first three, obviously, this was a serious thing. And when I looked at it, it took us, I think it got up to about 45 minutes to get the taser there. That was too long for me. And that was because we got them only, really, with our specialists, with our firearms officers and the other things that were grouped around central London. And in these outer parts, they weren't getting the service, in my view. So now in London, uh, at the moment, t at least two vehicles with four officers uh, are out in every borough. And uh, if we've got more officers on duty who are taser trained, then they can take them out as well. So we've got a minimum of four officers and we have a maximum of eight. So the response time is, you know, as you might anticipate, wherever it's healing or wherever, is pretty good. You can't ignore the findings of the survey, um, but I think what we've always done is to look at the evidence. So since we've deployed taser, if in fact there were more uh, assaults that could be prevented by taser use, I'm sure we would have revisited that. We haven't yet seen all that evidence. But I'm sure my successor will want to uh, look at that survey with the Federation, look at the evidence clearly and see whether or not we should be deploying more. Taser isn't always the answer every time. 90 odd percent of the time that we deploy taser, we do not fire it. So we take it out of the holster, there is a red dot, and usually people who are rational will respond to that red dot. Very rarely will, but of course people are psychiatrically ill, they're violent and enraged. It doesn't always work. But we really, very rarely discharge it. Um, so I think, uh, I think it's an ongoing debate, and you can't ignore the findings of that survey. But I wouldn't make any draw any immediate conclusions on the basis of it. But clearly our officers want it. Thank you very much, Sir Bernard. Uh, so we'll go to questions here. Um, we'll go to the front uh, first of all. So I just need to wait for the microphone. Thank you. Uh, David Abraham, Rusi. Um, enjoyed your presentation, uh, but there's um, one thing that's been going through my mind. Um, to what extent have politicians or the political agenda, if any, have influenced um, your decisions and um, what have they been, sir? Well, that's an easy one, David, isn't it? <laughs> <coughs> well, they, they've influenced our decisions quite a lot, as they should. Yeah, I mean, not in terms of individual operational decisions or who to arrest or not to arrest. But of course, you know, if you've got an elected government, or in London, as we've got a very complex, well, it's, it's multi layered political accountability, we've got the government are very interested in what happens in the Met. Two reasons. We run the counter-terrorist units for the country. And that's a very profound thing. And then we have an international reach with layers and officers, which I think now have 53 embassies around the world, covering 74 countries. Um, secondly, we are about a quarter of British policing. And so therefore, if things go well here, that's great. If they go badly, it will be noticed. So the government is always interested quite properly. Um, secondly, then we have a mayor. You know, elected with the largest mandate we are told of any politician in the UK, um, which is true, as a matter of fact. Uh, thirdly, we have 32 local authorities, all interested in whether it be Ealing, Tower Hamlets, they all want to know what's happening with their local police. And then we've got the GLA, the Greater London Assembly, 
who have a police crime scrutiny committee, which I have the joy of going to numerous times every year. And then we have the Home Affairs Select Committee, and I, I, won't, I won't bore you. There, there are quite a few layers who are all interested in the Met for the reasons I've already described. So it's entirely proper that we are held to account by them. We have to explain ourselves. And I think if you've got a case, you ought to be able to explain and persuade somebody. Even if they don't agree with you, I think hopefully they'll understand the reasoning. So I think that part works pretty well. Um, and then from time to time, there will be debates. So, you know, whether or not we deploy more tasers. There's a debate to have. And you could say, well, actually, it's an operational decision. And it is, and it happens. It's entirely my or our decision, whether we deploy more <coughs> tasers. But surely, if we've got a good case, we ought to be able to persuade people. So we do talk a lot to politicians, and not least of which, two big reasons. One, we need law that manages to protect the public. And if we can give advice, we would like to explain why the law might move on or why the law's got out of sync with reality. Cybercrime, for example. So we've got to have that conversation about that. And the only way we change law is properly through Parliament. And secondly, there's always a debate about resources. I want triple the amount of money for the Metropolitan Police, of course. But then there's the hospitals and the schools. That debate, we've got to have our, our part in. And so I think we both try and influence each other, but I don't think it properly. There's a question at the back as well, Danny. Uh, it's uh, Danny Shaw from the BBC. Uh, Sir Bernard, two very quick questions. Uh, your speech, you're talking about um, potential shortage of firearms officers. Firstly, do you really think you're going to run out? And secondly, you talked about wanting to see politicians and the public uh, supporting armed officers in the difficult days as well as in the non-contentious times. What exactly do you mean by that? Okay. Um, first of all, in terms of the, uh, <coughs> are we like to say shortage? I don't honestly believe so. Uh, at the moment, of the 600, I think we've either trained or got in training uh, over 400. But the thing I'm highlighting is we didn't, when we needed 600, I think we had about 850k forward. And our failure rate is reasonably high in training. And of course, during the time that we've been training, other people have retired. We didn't get 10,000 come forward and say, I want to carry a gun. Bearing in mind, we don't pay them anymore, by the way. They volunteer. They take all that risk on our behalf, you know, yours and mine, and they go forward when the criminal has a gun as the only people in 60 million who can take them on. You can't do it. I can't do it. They can. And that very small band of men and women, which is just over 3,000 in the UK, takes a risk on our behalf. So I feel quite passionately about them. But I think in short answer to your, uh, your question, Danny, there are challenges at the minute. We are not getting thousands come forward. I think we'll deliver the 600, but it will be an ongoing battle to maintain that number, which is why I think the context in which we set our debate needs to be, uh, needs to be moved on. Um, in terms of that point about, you know, support them in the contentious, non-contentious times, there are people in the room who have got a military background. I think we can all remember times when our government has been very supportive of the military when there's been challenges. I'd like to see that same commitment when the police have challenges too. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a question at the front here. John Wilson, uh, journalist and a member of RUSI. Uh, may I first of all say I'm a big fan of yours, Commissioner, and you'll be a hard act to follow. Uh, my question is this. <coughs> In your speech, you said that the force that you're leaving is now stronger and more professional than when you started. Uh, my question is, uh, how much has the substantial increase in the number of women employed contributed towards this? And how would you uh, answer people who criticise the increase in women by saying that they are physically weaker, have shorter careers, and are therefore more expensive to employ? Um, well, first of all, we're not... I mean, I concentrated my speech on race and physical representation. I didn't talk about women. We are still underrepresented by women, uh, with, you know, <coughs> for women. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I think we, of the applicants we have, we get about 40% of the recruit applications are women. I think it's, it's 35 to 40%. They are disproportionately successful in the selection process, but they are underrepresented in the applicants. So we don't seem to be attractive to women as we do to men. Um, our present numbers in the force are about 26%, so about one in four. Um, and I would argue we've got stronger results of having women, not any weaker. And certainly my uh, 
so when I look at my own culture, as I started, it was very male-dominated. It has its strengths, but we all know, this room is full of more men, men than women, it has its weaknesses too. And I've always seen that when we've had a balanced gender split for women and men, we have a better culture, not a worse one. Um, you don't need physical strength all the time. I mean, most of, we arrest about 250,000 times a year. The vast majority of those arrests are done with consent. People might find it hard to believe, but you know, people know what game they're playing. You know, they know they're going to disappear to France. We're going to get them. So they will come with us reasonably. But sometimes you do have to use force. But there are various ways that we can manage that. We use our voice. We use our sometimes physical um, things that we have. But as a mass, last resort, we, uh, we would use violence. And women are sometimes more powerful in that situation because it doesn't get a competition of egos. So for lots of reasons, women have been a real uh, support to us and done some fantastic things. Uh, my management board, over the last five and a half years, half of them be women. The assistant commissioner in charge of serious crime, counter-terrorism for a while, territorial policing, our biggest jobs. Um, so we've had a balanced leadership team. I would argue far better than most 250 companies in this country. Um, but I would still say, and I accept, that we need far more women to think it's an attractive career, and we haven't been as successful as we could be. Uh, in terms of, finally, just in terms of longevity, we're not seeing any great longevity. There was a change a few years ago, which was that officers can go part-time. That's been particularly helpful for women, but also for parents, so that there was child, you know, you have a child, then they go part-time, and then when they can, they're able to, they want to resume their career full-time. Whereas in the past, they would just leave, because they didn't have that opportunity to moderate their hours to be flexible to their childcare needs. So that's been a massive change for us. Thank you. I've seen a number of people have caught my hand. If you could just come right to the front here initially, and I'll try to endeavour uh, that you all do get to ask your questions. Uh, Anthony Newton, member. Thank you for an excellent presentation, and um, thank you for being an excellent commissioner. And special regards for my wife, who thinks you're terrific. <laughs> my, question is, <laughs> my question is, um, talking about the successes of what you've been doing in the last five years, looking back strategically, operationally, politically, are there things you would have done differently? And if so, I'd like to share what they were with us. Okay. Um, I have to be careful because there are journalists in the room. They're just waiting to write all the negative stories. Danny, you can stop writing now. Um, if I start, if you don't mind, with the, what I think we've achieved. When I took over in September of 2011, there were two crises. One was London. So this, you know, 26 of the 32 boroughs of this city would be writing. And nobody wanted it to happen again. A riot is an awful thing. People were murdered in those riots. Buildings were set on fire. We can all remember the images we saw. I'm only amazed that more people didn't get hurt. So when this thin veneer that we all have a civilization breaks down, you know, the bad guys take over. So we couldn't tolerate that, and we didn't want to see that again, and we managed to avoid it. We, uh, the Met itself, at a senior level, half the management board disappeared. Within 12 weeks, we had to recruit a new team. Um, we've got to get ready for the Olympics, if you remember, in 2012. G4S didn't quite, the, anybody, from, hopefully nobody from G4, but you know, it didn't quite work out, did it? Let's, let's face it. So we had to form a new plan with the military. Um, and during the succeeding 12 months, we had to get a plan to remove 600 million pounds from the budget. Our budget was 3.6 billion. And we had to take 600 million out. And therefore, I'm proud of the fact that over the succeeding years, we are the only police force in the country to main our police officer numbers. So we start out with 32,000, and that's where we stood. Policing in the UK went from, I think it was 144,000 officers to about 124. 42 forces with a similar financial challenge concluded it was okay to drop the number of cops. We made different savings. So we took out the back office, we got rid of buildings, we got rid of managers. In my view, that was a wise thing. But it's left us with a good pool of officers for which to help the city in the way that I, I described earlier. So I think those have all been good things. And part of the, uh, the benefit of that, as I said, our revenue stream has come down, the budget overall. But by selling significant numbers of buildings, we accumulated nearly a billion pound in cash. And we are spending it on two things, the buildings we keep and the IT we need for the future, which I think is a legacy that others will benefit from, as I described earlier. And then during those five and a half years, you know, we have cut crime. I described the most obvious uh, objective measure, which is that murders came down. Um, I could go through a few other measures. So I think we can show that we've been determinedly working hard in what is a changing city. This city is shifting at pace. I think one million people arrived over the last 10 years. That's a quarter of the population growth of the UK. 
some parts of London again younger, not older. And generally, young men drive crime. I don't defend it. I, don't, I can't explain. It. That's just what happens. So this city is quite a quite a challenge. So I think those are our achievements. Probably for others to comment on. In terms of things that I wish we'd done differently, I wish I'd embarked on the IT program earlier. Because then I wouldn't be saying it's coming for my successor. We've, you know, we've got some things now. Um, but that, that doesn't matter if it, it delivers a great thing for the people who are going to be here. But I'd, I would like to start that 18 months earlier. And I can give you all sorts of reasons I didn't. But that's the fact. And so I would have liked to have made that, that impression earlier. Um, but the only final thing I'll mention, because this is really relevant for my successor. <coughs> I've already said that the pressure is that we're going to be less officers. I am proud of the fact that we are changing. You know, we've now got over 4,000 officers from, from minorities. But as far as I know, there are only two ways you change your organisation. You either recruit new people who are different, or people like me who are a bit older or white leave. If you're not recruiting, you don't change, or you change at about 5% a year. And in this city, that's going to be a real challenge uh, for my successor if they can't recruit. Because I don't know of a clever way, other than what they did in Northern Ireland, which on discussion we may talk about, which need, needed a lacuna in the law, uh, which I would support, um, but I think that's going to be a real challenge for my successor. Thank you. Hey, George Robertson, uh, House of Lords, as an ex-politician, um, <coughs> uh, but also the, uh, the son, the brother and the father of police officers. Uh, I've got a, a degree of sympathy with uh, the dilemmas that you face, but what you've said about the Met is that you've got the bandwidth the strength, the size, to be able to deal with the kind of challenges that we'll face in the future, whether it's organized crime or it's uh, terrorism. But you, as you mentioned, 42 other police forces in England um, dispersed. How on earth is the country going to deal with these huge, you know, inescapable challenges with that kind of fragmentation? I appreciate these are difficult political questions to ask you, but you've only got a fortnight to go, so you can't really get into too much trouble if you answer. Yeah. Um, I'm going to seize that hope you offered. I, uh, I've always believed there should be less police forces. I think at the moment it's one of our potential solutions to a financial problem. I think more profoundly having 43 is an odd conclusion. Um, they were created around 1974 along local government boundaries. As far as I know, the criminals don't respect them. They don't notice them. I mean, London is your biggest argument, really. You look in London, and there's a very small police force in the middle called the City of London. It's got about 600 officers, 700 officers. That's smaller than one of our bits. And yet we are, they are surrounded by this very big thing called the Metropolitan Police. Why are they different? We have British Transport Police. You know, so London be a, be a microcosm of this discussion. Now, as you know, Scotland went from eight to one. That's quite a big thing for the UK to, or England and Wales to probably think about one, given our systems. But having far less would do two things for me. It would produce more consistent policing instead of 43 heads with 43 PCCs trying to agree things. It's quite hard. Not least of which are things like IT, which I'll briefly come back to. So I would argue if you could have less forces, you would reduce some of the background costs, we'd achieve more consistency and gain more agreement. And finally, I mean, we're still in the, you know, in the police in England and Wales. We spend nearly, it's, I think, £750 million on IT together. It used to be a billion. And yet we spend it in four to three packets. I mean, the IT companies must just love us. It's what a great opportunity it is to uh, play us off. I'm sure they don't. But we don't articulate very well as customers what we want either. And if I was them, it would, that would drive me, uh, you know, crackers. So for that reason alone, I would say we ought to produce our IT together. And I would argue that if we had less forces, we would be more consistent and better. Um, it could be a dangerous step, some may feel, to go to one. But the Scots seem to be managing okay. Thank you very much. Uh, further questions? There's uh, one at the back, please. Commissioner, hi. Uh, my name's Alexander Babuta. I'm here. At your voice, but I can't see the face. Uh, ah, sorry. I'm a research analyst in crime and policing here at RUSI, and um, you've talked a lot about the Met's use of technology in the future today, and I'm very glad to hear it. Um, and I just wonder if you could elaborate on it a little bit. You've spoken about uh, arming frontline police officers with tablet computers and iPads and stuff like that. But that's in order for that to be effective, um, 
do you think that the Met also needs to expand its capacity to manage and analyze very vast amounts of data that they collect on a daily basis? Um, in 2014, over 80% of the Met's IT investment was spent on updating old legacy systems which had become obsolete, leaving less than 20% for investing in new technology. And I'm just wondering um, what scope there is for uh, updating those old obsolete legacy systems and replacing them with new, more powerful ones. Okay, I want to challenge you about one thing. I think you said arming the officers with tablets. There are journalists here who will, I guarantee that think I'm going to put bullets in the tablets. <laughs> anyway, we are giving them the, uh, the tablets. Um, in terms of your first point, the, the, we do have lots of data and it's not always easy to access it. I think in the order of sequence, what we've got to do is sort out the infrastructure, you know, the, the boxes on which this thing is burst, the, the memory or the, the cloud, then the network that joins them, then the software that goes on them to either do the job in a, an app-based way rather than a big software-based way. But as you say, once you've got access to the data that we already have, it makes it remarkably efficient. And the problem is quite often it's held in separate packets. We've got all sorts of half fixes, but I, I agree with you, far more needs to be done. I'll give you just one brief example, facial recognition. So we arrest, I said earlier, we arrest about 250,000 times a year. Every time we arrest, we take DNA, photographs, and fingerprints. And the hardest thing to compare is that photograph Bear in mind, 250,000 people who commit crime, okay? People at the age of 38 don't still need to start committing crime. They keep coming back to us. So this is a repository of people who regularly commit crime. And over here, we still have a repository of CCTV showing us people who have just committed crime. But comparing the two is not remarkably efficient. You see it around the world. We've got a great thing. We've got a fantastic CCTV system which has grown in an adult way, which enables us to detect 95% of our murders at the moment. You cannot move in this city without leaving a footprint of either facial recognition or financial or mobile data. You, you would leave this behind. But to your point, it's sometimes quite hard to trawl through it if you don't know what you're looking for to establish patterns that that data might suggest to us rather than we're inquiring for. So I agree with you. I think there's more we can do there. Um, the point about the, 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 the relative investments, I, I, I couldn't be as precise as you about the 90% to 10%. The only thing I would say is if you've got existing systems, you've got to pay for them. So every year we pay for the stuff we've got. We've got a command and control, we have to pay for it. You have a license or whatever. So you, I don't think that simple comparison of 9 to 10 entirely works, but I do know that we have shifted our investment towards the future because I agree, and you, you see it in, in business as well as you see it in public service, I would argue our IT strategies have been legacy strategies. Your license runs out, the firm stops providing it, let's just replace it. Do you need it? Could you do better? I'm afraid over time our IT strategy has just replaced what we had rather than stood back and rethought because it's just simple in a procurement way just to keep rolling on a contract. So in that sense, I, uh, I do agree that we need to have a progressive strategy, which I'd argue that we've got, um, but remedying the past is probably 20 years of, uh, I can't say neglect, but just ad hoc development. Thank you. I think it's a... Uh, one of those areas in particular where you are seeing that same challenge as well replicated across forces in the country. I wonder how many other, um, sort of, obviously in their case, chief constables are having similar discussions. Um, come they back are. to your, your point about yeah, uh, that's why you need merging less. forces. Indeed. Less arguments. <laughs> uh, so we have time for further questions. Uh, there's one in the middle here, please. Samantha Newsham from the Home Office. I'm um, just kind of following on from that. So in terms of, I mean, you mentioned sort of cybercrime and digital enabled crime being one of the main issues. What, how would you judge the capacity, if you will, of police officers to actually deal with you know, the, the changing crime mix that we're sort of moving towards? Um, I think in terms of a general officer, it's quite hard for them to do everything. So I'm not sure we've fully equipped them yet to deal with cybercrime. Two and a half, three years ago now, we created, I think, what is still the biggest cybercrime squad in Europe. We've got 250 officers in that. We're trying to grow it to 500, were it not for the pressure I've already described in terms of it getting smaller. Um, so we concentrate our specialists in uh, one big squad in the middle and then some hubs. And the reason for that, I knew we were letting people down who were complaining about cybercrime, usually fraud online. Because you imagine what happens. We get a complaint in Croydon from somebody who's been scammed online, that lands on the desk of a detective side in Croydon. You've got another thousand victims in the north, if you're lucky, two in France. The attacker is in Estonia. The money went out through America. Where do you start? 
apart from the fact you've got the, the challenge of a digital trail of evidence, and where do you start with that? So we really were so far off the game. We are not that yet, yet there. But by coincidence, I think the Queen has today opened the uh, National Cybercrime Unit. And that, you know, a cyber protection security unit, that is another great step worldwide in sort of making a difference here. Because I think the way through it is going to be prevention rather than through arresting our way out of it. But to your point, we have been sadly lacking in terms of our skills and the number of people dedicated to it. But we put our foot in the water. Um, but as I said to the superintendent when she took over, I know we need a vehicle, but I don't know whether it's a bicycle or it's a tank at the minute. And her job was to develop it. And we're going to need help to make progress here. But I think the nature of the complexity of it is quite challenging. But I'll just say one final thing, if I may, on this. And I'll give you an example why I think prevention is really a powerful thing. It is said that 80 to 90% of the attacks online can be prevented by merely updating our own proprietary software. But how many people do it? And where's the incentive to do it? So, you know, if you, uh, if you leave your windows open at home, your insurer will not pay you in the same way. If you say you're parking your car in the garage and you don't, there will be a consequence. If you don't protect yourself against a cyber attack, I would argue the consequence is nil because you will be reimbursed for the loss. So why would you have the motive to improve your security? So I think, as you're from the Home Office, I think how we address that in government policy terms, I think, is, a, I think is, is something we could all work better on. I don't blame anybody for what I've just described, but I think it's true. Thank you. I think we'll try to take a couple more questions if we can. There was a hand that went up immediately there, and then we'll just take from this side of the room as well um, afterwards. Uh, sorry, there was a hand that went up immediately just there. Oops. Uh, hello, Vikram Dodd from The Guardian. You talked about in your speech about police officers in recent years being much maligned. And one of the biggest changes in the last five years has been the rhetoric from central government directed at the police service and uh, Theresa May's speeches, etc., etc., and words from David Cameron. Do you find, do you feel that the points they made and the rhetoric was always helpful? Or do you think there was a point or big point they had about where policing culture had got to by 2010? in being too big, too bloated, and too powerful. Right, see, it's interesting, Bikram, as a journalist, you've picked on politicians, but you didn't mention journalists. But I think it's a combined responsibility. Um, politicians are more I see you've been defensive now. <laughs> um, if I'd said... I know, yeah, it's all right. Um, I'd, I'd, only, I'd only say this, because I'm not going to bite the hook that you've just offered me. Um, I'll stick with my words, I said in the speech, really which I think we all share responsibility to support the police whether they need supporting and to challenge them where we get it wrong. Uh, but you, you know, it, there, is a, there can be an irony sometimes that people from all over the world come here to study how we do it. There must be a reason for that. I'm not causing them to. I'm not ordering them to. There must be a reason that they find that we're doing it quite well. I guess our standards are pretty good in terms of integrity. I think uh, the way that we do our job, it's still true that I think it's only about four forces in the world that uh, police their communities without guns. I think the Japanese are probably the one major developed country that will do it. Um, that tells you something about the support the public have for the police. And then how do you get that debate in the right place um, to encourage the police to improve rather than to cause them to you know, be challenged in a way that I think is not necessarily helpful? Thank you. And there's a question just over here as well. Hi, um, Arj Singh from the Press Association. Um, you seem to suggest in your speech that you were a bit worried about the cost of things like state visits eating into the Met's ability to protect London's neighbourhoods, for example. So do you think central government should bear a bit more of the cost of policing things like that, given that you've said it, should, it could cost millions of pounds policing, say, Donald Trump's visits? Now the Home Office are here, aren't they? So they hear this bit. There, yeah, to be fair, there is a mechanism by which we can recover costs from central government for exceptional events. And if you forgive me, I can't remember this saying something like 1% of the budget. If it's going to be more than that, and you see forces around the country have got an exceptional thing. You remember when uh, Shipman, the GP, murdered so many people, that force got help, and you could go through the list. <coughs> the, uh, one challenge for the Met, of course, because we're so big, and of course we must be able to absorb everything, it's quite hard for us to make our 1% threshold. Um, but that said, we can make the case for exceptional things. I, I, I think the, one of the things I was trying to get over is this. First of all, I've always believed genuinely in having a professional army, not a conscript army. And military people in the room will know that having well-led, well-trained, well-equipped people is more likely to be effective than having millions. 
having both together would be great, but you usually have to compromise somewhere. So I think that's broadly true for us. So I don't worship police numbers. I don't think you say you have to have 43,000, 39,000. There's not a perfect number. However, in this city, you do need significant numbers from time to time. I'll give you a couple of examples. <clears throat> so when the Notting Hill Carnival is on, we deploy 7,000 people to an area of about a square mile, probably less, when a million people enjoy themselves. And sometimes they don't. But to police that area with a million people in it is quite a challenge. New Year's Eve, I refer to it in my speech. Our New Year's Eve uh, celebrations went ahead when others decided to stop theirs, which is fine. And we deployed 3,500 officers. Now, people in the room who understand logistics realise to create 7,000 or 3,500, if you haven't got them sat in a room waiting for that event, means you can only redeploy them from somewhere else. And our somewhere else is called the 32 Burrs of London. So we have to have enough officers in those places from time to time to withdraw people. And the final example, when uh, the, American, uh, the Americans made the decision around uh, immigration from certain countries, 20,000 people turned up here in Whitehall within a day to protest about that. I make no comment on whether that's valid or not. They all were very peaceful, actually, and they all made their point fairly. But we didn't know at the beginning which way to go. So you've got to r suddenly pull out 1,000, I think it was between 500 and 1,000 officers, to just make sure that that was okay. So I think our broad point that we make <coughs> to government is exceptional events demand that, one, we have resilience within the Met, Number two, from time to time, it's a very costly exercise. I think it costs us for the Notting Hill Carnival, it must now be nearly £7 million. These are significant sums even for a large organisation, as well as the resilience of the number of people. So that's the point I was trying to address. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, looking at the time, I think we'll have to bring the discussion to a close there. Um, so, Bernard, on behalf of Rusi, I would like to thank you for sharing your insights this afternoon. And I think in particular for your candour, uh, in discussing some of the challenges that have faced you during your tenure, but also are likely to face your successor. Uh, so, once again, ladies and gentlemen.